you were part of a groundbreaking discovery that shook the world, something that was connected to King David. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, David is probably one of the most well-known figures of the Bible. Um, he's mentioned, I think, 990 times, 975 times, depends on which version of the Bible you look at because some of them have a titles as well. From the first time he's mentioned early in the Old Testament all the way to the very last uh, chapter of Revelation, actually. Um, and yet there are, have been major questions in the last 30 years about the historicity of David, about his background and, and all of that kind of thing. So this is a National Geographic cover story focusing on our excavations some years ago. Um, we received a grant from National Geographic asking the question, what about King David? What about that search for King David? So and we are were, you mentioned in this actual uh, National Geographic special? Yeah, our project is. Yes, Wonderful. yes, yes. So it's it's been it's been really exciting to work at this project because it it connects in so many ways to that very early history of Israel and right. its first kings. Right. Yeah. So why is David so important for uh, discovery purposes? What does it tell us? How does it confirm scriptural authenticity? Well, there's a number of questions around David, and um, one of the big questions that came up is a question, yes, that Philip Davies uh, posed in 1992. Philip Davies was a professor at the University of Sheffield in England, and he questioned the entire narrative, whether it was factual or mythical. He says, basically, it's as mythical as the stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. He's an English scholar focusing on that right. aspect of English history. And he, he used the argument that the biblical empire of David and Solomon um, hasn't the faintest echo in the archaeological record and basically argued on the basis of absence of evidence for the lack of the existence of David. We never found his name in the archaeological record. We never found a, a whole lot relating to his empire, if you will. And I can see why that would be super important because if he is mentioned so much in the Old Testament, even the Messiah is called the son of David. Right. Confirming David would be very, very crucial, especially as being the most famous king in the Old Testament. Right, exactly. I mean, I was living in Jerusalem in 1996, and the entire city celebrated the 3,000-year anniversary of Jerusalem because David conquered Jerusalem. And so if David didn't exist, there's a big problem for millions, billions of people around the world, right? Incredible, I can yeah. see why so much hinges upon this. Right, exactly. Right. What about the evidence that proved the extended kingdom of David? Well, again, he used two words in, the, in this quote here. He said, as yet, which was a kind of caveat. In science, you never make an argument on the basis of the lack of evidence. Scientists always work on the basis of data. And so we had to go back in the field and continue to work and look for evidence. That's what archaeologists do. We uncover millions of bits of data uh, every project that we work on. We have to process that data for years after the project is over. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how this project began in 2007 with my colleague at the, University of, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Yosef Garfinkel, a small pilot project, and then he invited me that same year to join as the major American partner in the project. And so we had a dig going on for from 2007 till 2013 at a little site called Kirbet Kayafa. Now, before we even get to that site, though, something amazing that as yet on this quote happened the very next year. This was published in 1992. Okay. In 1993, if there was an amazing discovery made at Tel Dan, this inscription was found by archaeologists in the very northern part of Israel, right on the border to uh, Lebanon, Tel Dan is mentioned in the Bible. The borders of Israel are from Dan to Beersheba. Over and over again, you read that in the Old Testament. And in this inscription by an Aramean king, we have a reference to a, a campaign that took place against the kingdom of Israel and Judah and against the kings of Israel and Judah. And the king of Israel or the territory of Judah is referred to as the house of David. Beit David in Hebrew. That's exactly the way the Bible refers to the kingdom of Judah over and over again in Kings and Chronicles. So when this was found in 1993, we suddenly had David, and he was remembered as the founder of the dynasty 150 years later because this dates actually 140, 150 years after his, his reign. That would have been like front page news. This was front page news. This wow. was in the Wall Street Journal. This was, this was everywhere. Yes. Incredible. Yeah. What did the skeptics say as this information started to come out? They were very excited. I would say 99% of the, of the field accepts this as, as evidence that David existed. There's no question. Okay. Interestingly, Davies, though, who published that book, suggested it was a forgery, which 
brings all kinds of questions <laughs> about the archaeologists. One of the leading archaeologists who found that used to be the director of the Department of Antiquities in Israel. Anyway, that's another story, but he's in the minority. There's nobody. This is in the Israel Museum on prominent display, and millions of tourists see it every year. Wonderful, man. So uh, there was, when it comes to this discovery, what were the challenges, the other challenges uh, regarding you know the discovery of David that just were there. So the, the mythical argument was the first one. The inscription kind of did away with that argument. Then the argument went to how big was the kingdom of David? The Bible describes this massive kingdom, his son Solomon building the temple, all these kinds of things. So a, a, another couple of scholars, I know these people very well, they, they wrote this book in 2006, some years later, and they argued, as you can see, there was no evidence for extensive um, populated hinterland, that is, there wasn't a lot of settlements around Jerusalem. There's no evidence for major buildings or fortifications, no evidence that Jerusalem was a major city. And you can see the argument, no evidence, no evidence, no evidence, no evidence. Right. <laughs> so they're making the same argument, which is really shocking because this is not a biblical scholar now like Davies was. These are archaeologists. You don't make arguments from the lack of evidence. You make arguments from evidence. Right, especially when archaeology <clears throat> archaeology hinges upon this idea of the doctrine of discovery. We're right. in the process of learning more, exactly. and we can't say something doesn't happen because it may come out in the future. Exactly, and that's exactly what happened after this book was published. We started our excavations in 2007, the next year, and we began to fill those gaps. This is the little site of Kirbet Kayafa. It's in a very strategic location on the road leading up to Jerusalem and on the border to Philistia, and it actually overlooks the famous valley of Elah, where the story uh, and the uh, fight between David and Goliath took place. Probably one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament. Um, and that made it very significant. And what was really important about this site is that as we began to excavate it, we found hundreds and hundreds of pots, vessels, different vessels that dated back to that time period of the uh, 10th century. The pottery that was found in these massive destructions that took place, a massive destruction where you have hundreds and hundreds of various types of vessels that are, that are taking, that are going on and that we're finding there. And these vessels are reconstructable um, and they provide a whole um, chronological anchor point for the period that we're talking about, the period of David. Incredible, yeah. incredible. So what was, uh, what was the, the, the conversation amongst archeologists when information, more, more of this contributing information started to come out? Was there uh, just fair, this is agreement, this is all, yes, this is confirmed now, or was this something that took some time for them to process? It was, it was controversial because we were, we were going up against uh, a new paradigm, a new revisionist paradigm for history and trying to argue now for the uh, more traditional approach that archaeologists had accepted for decades. You know, this was not a question until, until the late, um, let's say the, the late 80s, early 1990s that this began to be questioned. So before that time, we had a lot of um, archaeologists from across the field here at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, William Albright, others who accepted this as the foundation for biblical history. But now we had this challenge, right? So, so we, had, we had these massive amounts of pottery. We had seal impressions that dated back to this time period. We had radiocarbon dates from uh, Oxford University that solidified the time of the 10th century. We had a pristine site that was founded at the time of Saul and David. And this was uh, really unique because it was on the border. It was, you know, a day's journey from Jerusalem, quite a ways away from Jerusalem. And yet here we have a fortified city. We discovered mass, not just fortifications, but massive fortification. These fortifications were double walls, double walls that, that um, were actually quite deep. The, the, the site was only occupied during two periods, the time of Saul and David, and then there was a 700 year gap and Alexander the Great built over the top of it as well because of its strategic location right at the crossroads uh, there. And so we, we have this early site with these massive, massive walls, these, these huge gates, one facing towards Philistia, the enemy on the other side, the Philistines, and one facing towards the road that leads up to Jerusalem. But these fortifications really, um, were enormous. Uh, we're talking about 100,000 tons of stone that were used um, to build these walls and, and these fortifications. So not somebody building you know, a, a, a pen for sheep or, or cows or something right. like that. So really massive stuff. The design of these walls actually, this is the gate going in. You can see the, you can see the uh, drain going out of the gate. Um, that's a drainage uh, 
a system that's moving out of the gate. So they had an extensive infrastructure. It was, was an infrastructure, this. exactly. This was not simply something that was built out here on its own. We think this, this implies organization from Jerusalem um, or from some kind of capital. You don't put a, a small garrison fort like this city, which had maybe 500, 600 inhabitants, out by itself. It had to have some backup because it's right on the border to these massive Philistine sites. What do you think the site was used particularly for? Was it just a, a military outpost? What was it exactly used I for? I think it was a military outpost right on the border of Judah to kind of protect that main road that leads up to Jerusalem. Later on in history, we have multiple cities like this. We have Lachish, we have Azekah, we have Sucho, we have Bet Shemesh where the Ark came to after it was captured by the Philistines. All these cities are fortified yeah, a little bit later, but this is one of the earliest ones dating back to Saul and David. And you can see, you, you know, those fortifications are huge too because they answer one of those big questions, right? right. Was this, what, did we have fortifications at that time? Right, you can read about that in, in the Book of Kings and the in Chronicles, you see that several of these kings were building fortifications. That's right. Right, like right. it lines very much with scripture. Right. That's incredible. And as you're going about, as you're, this discovery is taking place, you're seeing more and more confirmation of, of the Bible's accuracy. You know, it's, when you look at other religious literature, let's say, for example, other ancient Near Eastern accounts, right? What makes the Bible so unique and so different than some of the other accounts from other cultures? That's a really good question. You know, we have an institute of archaeology at a Christian university where I teach, and um, it's, you, you, it's focusing on biblical archaeology. And you normally wouldn't have, I mean, where else would you have that, you know? Um, the Bible lends itself to that because the Bible is actually a, a book that's constituted in history or a series of 66 books that are constituted in history. It, it talks about a God who acts in human history. And in that sense, God allows himself to somehow be tested as well because we can go back into that history and check all these places, all these geographical locations where God is working with his people and figure out what was going on at that time you know, ar archaeologists have now, we've talked about the discovery of the name of David, but we've, we've discovered about 120 names of, of individuals that are mentioned in the Old Testament. Some of them are famous kings like Nebuchadnezzar or Sennacherib. Others are people that are mentioned in one verse just in passing. Um, and that, that confirms the historicity and the authenticity of what we are reading when we read these stories. You know, I grew up uh, in, in the Hindu culture, and in Hinduism, there are many, obviously, God-fearing Hindus and stuff. But, you know, the literature is, is a lot of myths and stories. Exactly. But many of these don't have archaeological confirmations. It sounds like the Bible is definitely a, a real book describing real people in real locations. Exactly. Who had real experiences with a very real God. Exactly. In, in Hinduism and many of these Eastern religions, it's, it's, they're, they're, it's more ephemeral. They're ideas, philosophies, that kind of thing. This is something that's rooted in everyday life. This is rooted in history. And, and it makes, God is a, a, a he's, 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 he's a God who interacts in human history, interacts in our lives. And so that, that is something that is very, very unique and really makes the Bible unique when compared to all these other major religions out there. You're not gonna find an institute of Hindu archeology span or Buddhist archeology span or Taoist archeology span because it doesn't lend itself to that kind of investigation. That's incredible. Just more evidence for why we can trust the scriptures. That's right. But I got one more question for you. Yeah. As someone who has studied the ancient Near Eastern accounts, as you look at uh, these other cultures and, and uh, their description of history, uh, whether it's creationism, whether it's a uh, flood, whether it's, uh, you know, some of their, their kings. What do you notice as distinctives of, of biblical history versus these other ancient Near Eastern accounts in regards to their understanding of God, of humanity? What do you notice are clear differences here? Oh, I have a list of 24 of those, so it's going to be a little <laughs> bit more than, than what we can handle here. But there's definitely a difference between what I would refer to and other scholars have referred to as the mythical view, which the Bible has been accused of, but it really doesn't fit into that genre at all. The mythical view, which is polytheistic, which is pantheistic, where, where the cosmos and God are the same in one. The Bible teaches that, the, that God is the creator and separate from the cosmos. And it's something very, very different. That allows him to interact in the cosmos. Otherwise, we just all are really part of God, right? right. In, in the end, when you boil it down. 
Um, the other thing that is really, um, when I compare it to other literature in the ancient Near East, which I've read a lot of, it's very different because those are also polytheistic. Those are all, they, they worship nature. They, they deified everything in nature, you know, sun and moon, obviously, but it, then everything else as well. Yeah, one account that I read, they oftentimes, these other creation accounts, for example, they start off with, um, uh, there was the universe and then there was a cow and then the cow gave birth to a god. So in other words, the universe was in existence oftentimes well before the deity shows up. Right. Whereas the scripture said, wait a minute, uh, God was was there in right. the beginning. God right. created the heavens and earth. So nature and the universe follows uh, from God's creation as opposed to being something before him. Right, right. It's very different. Many of these myths uh, in the ancient world are actually, they're theogenies, not cosmologies. They're theogenies. They actually describe the creation of of the, the universe as gods, and, and, and they're kind of personified. I mean, the Egyptians had 22,000 gods. Everything was deified. Um, I think in Hinduism, that has been multiplied to 33 million gods, right? right? So that's what was that a word continuation. You what was that word? Theogony. Theogony. It's okay. a theogony. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a creation of gods by the gods. Wow. So in these other accounts, you see the creation of gods, whereas the right. scriptural account says no. Right. God has always been. Well, there. you look at Greek and Roman mythology, and the gods are very capricious. They're very much like us. They, they have relations. They have children. They get into conflict. fights. They get into conflict. Exactly. You don't have that in the Bible. There's one God. He's sovereign. He's wonderful. He creates a perfect world, and he finds a solution for humanity in that perfect world, in that imperfect world after sin enters. And there's something, something amazing about that. The other thing that is really amazing in the Bible, while we're on this tangent a little bit, is, is this. When I read the Bible, and I read ancient Egyptian texts, for example, I'm an Egyptologist, and um, you, in, in, in the Egyptian texts, you never, the Egyptians are always victorious in their military campaigns. There's never an admittance of defeat, ever. You read the Babylonian texts, the Hittite texts, the Assyrian texts. They get rid of it. They get rid of they all the They get rid the of the defeats, or they're quiet about them. They never talk about them at all. You read the Bible, it's filled with God's people's triumphs as well as their defeats. They're, they're the things that, that, that they did well and the things that they really didn't do well at all on. So what you're describing essentially is this evidence for em this embarrassment evidence seems to actually work in in favor of the accuracy of Scripture. I think, I think the Bible gives us a more accurate account of what really happened in the ancient world, whereas many of these, and of course you, t you talk to an Egyptologist or an Assyriologist or some of the experts, and, and they might not see it quite that way, but there's definitely an element of, of whitewashing history where you don't have that in the Bible, I think. And the Bible gives us then, as a result of that, the Bible gives us not only the realities of what people faced back then, like we do today, but it also gives us direction on how to deal with those realities from yeah. a biblical perspective. I love what you're saying. The, the Bible tells us the truth about God's goodness, but also the, tells us the truth about man's brokenness. Professor uh, Hazel, we've been taking a good look at this uh, archeological site that you were a part of, this, this fortification. What else did you discover in regards to the gates, the very entrance of this fortification? Well, the name of the modern name of the site is Kirbat Kayafa. That's an Arabic name. And so sometimes Arabic names tie into the Hebrew names because these are sister languages, kind of like Dutch and German, and they're related historically. But the reality is that sometimes they don't. And in this case, the modern name doesn't help us at all. So what was the identification of the ancient site? Actually, the two we found two gates at this site which is very unusual, especially for a small site like this. We know Jerusalem had multiple gates in ancient times. The Bible talks about that. Today there are eight gates in, in the old city of Jerusalem. Um, in ancient times, uh, though most cities, besides large cities like Jerusalem, most cities only had one gate because it was the weakest point of, of defense. You know, it was the hole in the wall that you could easily go through, right? That's where they take the battering ram. Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. So to have more than one gate weakened your city. And for a little fortification like this with only 500 garrison troops maybe here or families, this would be very, very difficult and very unusual to have two gates. So when we found those two gates, we were like, man, 
two gates. That's interesting because there's a verse in the Bible in 1 Samuel 17, 52, telling the story of Goliath as we go through the story, the famous story of David and Goliath, where Goliath has been slain by David. He's been hit by the sling stone. His head has been chopped off. And then it says, when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. And the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath into the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sha'ariam road to Gath and Ekron. Now, when you and I read this, it's like all these names just, you know. But the reality is the, the narrator, the, the writer, wanted you to know exactly where this took place and exactly how this happened. And when you stand in the Elah Valley and you look down from Azekah, which is on this slide here, down into the Elah Valley, you can see the layout perfectly of how this all would have, would have transpired. And so what's interesting with these, with these two gates is in that verse, Sha'ariam, we actually have possibly the identification of our site because Sha'ar in Hebrew means gate. And I am is the dual ending. I am is the dual ending, which means two. So this is maybe the city of two gates. We have suggested this in, the, in our publications. Wow. It's been accepted by a number of uh, you know, uh, historical geographers. And if this is the case, we've actually found a city that's mentioned in the story of David and Goliath for the first time. More verification of what the scriptures are saying. Exactly, right. exactly. So that's, that was very exciting. What other evidences did you find besides uh, the Judean inscriptions? How do we know this is a, a Judean site? Actually, diet is a very important part of determining some of these things. We, we can see that, that there's kind of this line, this, this, this line arbitrarily that we put here that separates the territory of Philistia on the left from the territory of Judah on the right. You see the sites of Ekron and Gath that are circled here. Those are Philistine sites. I excavated at Ekron for many years in the 90s. I excavated at Ashkelon on the coast with Harvard University in the early 90s. We've excavated all those sites. 15 to 30 percent of the bones that we find, because we collect all the faunal, faunal material, all the bones, we want to know what people ate, right? 15 to 30 percent of the bones at the Philistine sites are pig bones. Right, and We've that done, would indicate that, that, that pork pig was, was part a, of their pork diet. Pork was a major part of their diet, right? Major part of their diet. We've also done DNA analysis. This is just very recent, the last five years, four years. We've done DNA analysis on those pig bones, and we know that they were not indigenous to this territory. They actually are European pigs. So they were brought in. They were brought in. And where did the Philistines come from? They came from the Aegean world, from Greece, from Mycenae and that area, and brought their culture with them and their diet with them as well. What's interesting at our site of Kirbet Kayafa, in seven seasons of excavation, we've uncovered 25% of the site. We have tens of thousands of bones. We don't have a single pig bone in any of that. Wow. Not a single one. Verification and, of and, the, and, the Jews and, were in that place. Exactly. Well, I was there a, a few years ago. Um, and and I, there were four buses of, of tourists that, that were coming to the site. It's now a national park, by the way. They were coming to the site, and, and there was a group of, of students that were being toured by a professor. And, and as I was walking by, somebody in our group heard my name mentioned, and they said, oh, Dr. Hosel's right there, one of the directors. And so I went and talked to this group of young students training to be educators in Israel. And, uh, and I said, tell me, do any of you keep kosher? And uh, most of them raised their hands because this was a Jewish religious university that they were attending. And I said, um, yeah, well, you know what? That, that tradition goes back here 3,000 years. They were doing the same thing at this site. This is part of your identity and part of who you are and part of the biblical narrative that we have in Leviticus 11. So that was really exciting. Yeah, wow, it's incredible. Just all this confirmation or all is just contributing to this idea that th this was very much a, a biblical site. That's right. What about the idea of literacy? Well, literacy was a big problem, and uh, it's one of the major issues that we dealt with, you know, in, in that book, you know, no evidence for extensive literacy. So the Don't accusation was that literacy was not something common. Exactly, or, or maybe even non-existent in the 10th century, in, the, in the, about 1000 BC, when David and Saul were around. And that's a problem because in the Bible, we have the largest book of the Bible is the Psalms, which is kind of the hymn book for, for the ancient Israelites. And uh, a large number of those psalms were written by David, right. 78 of them. So if David, did, did David didn't write those psalms, what, what does that do to the whole thing of David, right? Um, we found this inscription uh, in 2008. Um, on October 30 of 2008, it was the second top story on CNN.com. This is the oldest Hebrew inscription ever uncovered in Israel. 
uh, five lines of writing. You can see on the first line, you can see the letter A kind of sideways, and you can see it upside down. And later on, a couple lines down, you can see it right side up. Actually, it's the upside down is the correct version. That's the Aleph in Hebrew. This is the alphabet already being, being written out. There's a lot of letters that are missing that were not preserved because this is written in ink on a broken piece of pottery about this size. But, uh, but we know that it says, begins with the words, do not do, which is something that we find a lot in the Bible, right? right? And, uh, and it, so it's a typical Hebrew phrase. And when we first found it, we brought it in 2008 to Boston where we had our professional meetings. And here were, is my colleague standing, uh, Joseph Garfinkel from the Hebrew University, with two of the leading scholars from Harvard University, Frank Moore Cross is looking at the object right now. He couldn't sleep that night. He was so excited because he's the, he's the world's leading epigrapher. He passed away a few years ago. Things but that he was, keep archaeologists up at night. Yeah, right. <laughs> this was the first inscription, the oldest Hebrew inscription. And he has been studying this in his entire life. And he says, I couldn't sleep. This was so exciting, you know. So, And Larry Steger in the background sitting in the chair as the director of the Ashkelon excavations for 35 years. The letters were so faded, we took this to a number of imaging labs in Santa Barbara, uh, Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, different places, to just get the best images of, of this so we could read it. And there have been at least 25 scientific articles written with different readings of what this is, whether it's a list of names or whether this is describing the establishment of kingship in Israel, as one person says. Anyway, there's a lot of different discussions about it, and you have to reconstruct the text by putting in letters that are, are not visible anymore. But at any rate, it was very, very exciting. And, and this is one of those images, and you can see you know, some of the clarity that comes out with that. This is the, uh, this is the genesis of our alphabet, you know, 3,000 years later that we're still using. Um, this made the cover of Biblical Archaeology Review, the popular magazine. Um, a few years later, in 2012, we found another inscription in one of the houses, a part of a jar, actually, uh, with an inscription on the shoulder of the jar. And uh, here you can see the inscription on the shoulder of the jar, which is really amazing. It's incised into the jar before firing, not written by ink this time. So this was much better preserved. You can see the jar was smashed, and we had to put it back together again. But it mentions for the first time an individual that's also mentioned in the Bible. At least the name is mentioned in the Bible. That's Eshbaal or Ishbaal. He was one of the sons of Saul and one of the major um, princes of Israel. Now the Ishbaal we have on this inscription is not the Eshbaal of the Bible. It doesn't say Eshbaal the son of Shaul. If that was the case, that would be amazing. Right. But it's another Eshbaal, son of Beda, but it's the same name dating to the same time period which gives us, and this made headlines again in May of 2015 when we published it in our scientific um, journal. Um, and it elicited a call from the prime minister's office in Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu calls my colleagues. I wasn't in the country at the time, but he didn't call. One of his associates called my colleagues and said, you have a meeting with the prime minister in, in 10 minutes. And they didn't even have a, he's, Professor Garfinkel's wearing jeans here and a shirt. He didn't even have time to change you know, for this meeting. But why would a prime minister be interested in a broken piece of pottery that's been laying in the dirt for, for you know, 3,000 years? He's interested because this is, again, the earliest Hebrew inscription, and this is about identity. It's about the identity of a people. It's about the identity of a people of the book. And it's about the identity of, of these cities and these places that still are there to this day. So this was a very exciting moment. And it just goes to show that if we have two inscriptions at a, a, a border site, you know, far away from Jerusalem. And now we have new inscriptions since then that have been found in Jerusalem as well and dating to the same time period. If we have these inscriptions, we know that, that people, if they're writing, you know, on, on jars and, and on, on, on broken pieces of pottery, they were literate. And they could have been writing other things as well. And David certainly could have been writing the Psalms. This is the irony here because uh, the uh, Professor Davies, the archaeologist, who said, hey, look, we haven't found anything that, right. that says that David or, or these kings existed. And then right afterwards, it's just been this series of One after findings the other. confirming. And, and, and as far as sites go, Kirbet Kayafa was the first one that we excavated dating back to that time period. In the last 10 years since those excavations, we have six more sites that date to the same time period in the same part of the southern part of Judah. And, and they, we refer to the pottery that we find even at those sites now as Kayafa pottery because that, that wow. our site has become the type site for that what we call Iron Age 2A period. And so it's very exciting and, and there's just been an explosion of discoveries now that we kind of know, okay, 
this period existed, these people existed at this time, and these were Judahite people, Ju Juda J yeah, Judean people that lived here in this, in this vicinity. It, it dismisses this idea that David was this just tribal, local tribal leader, but that we see that his kingdom was very much extensive, yes. spread out, and recognized right. exactly how the Bible describes because, it. Because if you look at this picture, Kirbat Kayafa there, these are, you can still see the roads, the modern roads there. That's the gas station, by the way, where we always get gas, um, right next to the Philistines <laughs> there. But the anyway, uh, yeah, <laughs> and Ace Hardware is just up the road, by the way. That's where we get our <laughs> tools sharpened. But anyway, um, Kirbat Kayafa was a guardian, was guarding these major roads leading up to Jerusalem. So if you think of I-95 here in the D.C. area, um, or the Beltway, you know, <laughs> what would guard um, the capital of, of, of our country here in, in Washington, D.C.? Um, what would guard the capital of Jerusalem, these fortified cities? And now we have a whole plethora of them popping up and being excavated right now by other teams. Wow. In addition to your work being found in the academic literature, where else was this documented? Well, we, of course, publish our results and, and scientific reports, and we have, a, I think, six volumes now out on our scientific publications as well. And, uh, and then we've published a popular book um, called um, In the Footsteps of King David, Revelations from a Biblical City, which was published by a British press, Thames and Hudson. Um, and that's available for people to, to purchase as well. And I don't make any royalties on any of this stuff. And it's scientific stuff, so it's very technical. And you know, you sell a few here to a few libraries, but publication is the very important. You, you excavate these sites, you know, and if you don't publish the material, that information dies with you. So when you get a license to excavate in another country, um, it's like taking a loan out from the bank and, and publishing this material is paying back that loan to that company, country and, and, and disseminating that information for others as well. Wow, incredible. In, in wrapping all of this up, why is this really important? What makes David so central to Bibles, the Bible's history? He's hugely important, hugely important. As Eilat Mazar, who just passed away a year ago, said in this article in, in National Geographic, she was an ar archaeologist working in the city of David in Jerusalem. She said, if you take David and his kingdom out of the book, you have a very different book. The narrative is no longer historical, but a work of fiction. I mean, think about it. David is the most mentioned, most talked about person in the Bible almost a thousand times mentioned from the book of Ruth all the way through to the, the last. And, and he's pivotal for the whole kingdom of Israel. What would there be without David? Well, he wouldn't have defeated Goliath on that day, and perhaps Saul's armies and Israel would have been wiped out by the Philistines. Um, without David, um, Jerusalem would not have been established as the capital because it was David that conquered the capital. And without that capital being there as Jerusalem, um, his son Solomon couldn't have built the temple there, which served as a temple for the next 400 years. And even beyond that, after the Babylonian destruction was rebuilt, again, and then rebuilt by Herod later on and was around during, during the, 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 the New Testament period as well. Um, but the most important aspect of this, of course, we talked about the Psalms already. The most important aspect of all of this is it is the son of David that is prophesied as the coming Messiah. Mm. And if you take David out of the picture, what hope do you have for a Messiah? Right. That is essential. And I just want to turn to the last chapter of the Bible, and this is Jesus. This is red letter in my book, Bible. You know, that means Jesus is speaking. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then a little further down, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel, my messenger, to testify to you these things to the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And then it concludes, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's how the Bible ends. If you take David out of the picture, you have to take Jesus out of the picture. Right. And um, that's an important issue, not only for Jews, of course, because of the hope of the Messiah, which they haven't accepted yet as coming but for Christians, billions of Christians around the world who are looking forward to that second coming. That's right, and if we can trust what the Bible is saying about David, we can trust what the Bible is saying about 
you know, the history of Israel, we can trust what it tells us about Jesus. That's right. And 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 the and the words of Jesus. And that makes the Bible also unique. That's the second thing that makes the Bible unique. It was constituted in history, and 30% of the Bible is prophecy. No other religion has that. No other religious sacred work has that. 30% prophecy. And there are about 350 of those prophecies in the Old Testament that point towards the Messiah and specifically point towards the fulfillment that Jesus makes. And part of that, of course, is David, but everything else that moves along with that. So those two things allow us, again, to go back and test the scriptures and to see whether these things are so. Dr. Halls, I can see why you're so excited about archaeology. It's contagious <laughs> and uh, gets me really excited about archaeology. Thank you so much for being here. Your mind may have been blown on some of these discoveries, or perhaps you've just uncovered more questions for yourself. After our break, we'll see if the questions of our studio audience matches up with yours and what Dr. Hazel has to say about them. So don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been digging into archaeological evidences with Dr. Michael Hazel and some of his landmark discoveries. Right now, I'd like to turn to our in-studio audience for some questions. We have any questions? Right over there. Why do they make historical inscriptions on pottery? Basically, it was something that was readily at hand. If you walk over a site in Israel, even today, any archaeological site, you have literally hundreds of pieces of pottery on the ground um, as you're walking. I have tourists that I, you know, and students that I take over there and they wanna pick them up and put them in their suitcase and bring them home. You're not supposed to do that. But basically when a pot broke, um, sometimes they would broke, break into smaller pieces, but, uh, but you could pick one of those up and, and just write on that. We get the word paper from papyrus and papyrus was extremely complex to make in Egypt. Um, it was very expensive to make and, um, and so, we call them ostraca, these, these uh, inscriptions on pottery, and, and we probably find more of those because they're also preserved over time. Pottery just lasts forever, it's kind of like plastic, you know? Um, and so we, we, we find those a lot more, and the other materials that maybe they wrote on, whether that was parchment, which was leather, or whether it was, um, unless it was in a very dry area, like the Dead Sea Scrolls down near the Dead Sea, they would deteriorate in the rains, in the winter rains, they, after time, just like they would here. So the answer to the question is, they would just pick up a piece of pottery and, and use that to inscribe with ink. Um, it was readily at hand, it was easy to preserve, and it was something that they didn't have to pay a lot of money for. Hey, let me ask you a question, Dr. Hazel. Do you have any artifacts at your home? No, I'm not allowed to have artifacts in my home. <laughs> I have a museum. I, we, I curate a museum at our university, and, um, and we have a lot of artifacts there. Gotcha. Yes, yes. Okay. I can imagine the temptation. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Right over there. Hi, we talked a lot about um, evidence for David and other historical figures um, in the Bible, but I was wondering if there was also evidence to um, bring in the presence of God in these people's lives. So how do you find that in the archaeological record? One of the big problems in the Iron Age, that is the Old Testament biblical period, is we don't have a lot of inscriptions. That was part of the accusation we had by Professor Finkelstein and others who said, you know, the lack of evidence. So we're beginning to find more of those, but even today we have six inscriptions that are, you know, um, partial and sometimes broken and sometimes not complete. But we have another very important source and these are seals and seal impressions, which was like the ancient signature of an individual. They would wear these either as a ring around their finger or around their necks. And in Jerusalem in particular, and other sites too, we have found hundreds of seal impressions. This is the, the impression they would make in clay with their seal. Then they would put that on a document and send the document off. If they used papyrus or parchment or whatever, they would tie a string around it, send that off to another person. And so we have these. And, and they all contain the names of individuals. And in those names, by the way, Hebrew names all have meanings. Um, our names do too. We don't always know what they are, but uh, they have meanings. My name is Michael, and it ends with E-L. 
and El or L is the generic Semitic term for God. So my name means who is like God. Daniel means God is my judge. So all these names had meanings. And, and a, a study was done some years ago by Jeffrey Tigge on the onomastica or these names on these seals. Uh, he's a professor, was a professor at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And he discovered that 94% of these, of these names on these sources all had the theophoric or God element of either Yahweh, the personal covenant name of God, or El, the, the name of God, often referred to in the Bible as Elohim. And this tells us that people who named their children named them in ways that was reminiscent of their faith and of their, their religion. And he made a very compelling case that even though we may not have many images because they weren't allowed to make images, the second commandment, we have this element that indicates that there was some continuity of religion over, over centuries of time. It showed their faith in God. It showed their worship yes, of God. Yes, exactly. If you're, gonna, of their... if you're gonna name your child that. Now, of course, today we have many Christian names, and that doesn't mean we necessarily are practicing Christians or practicing Jews. If we have a Jewish name, um, that may just be part of the heritage that we've inherited, you know, but it shows any way that that is culturally rooted in the people and that continued on through through the centuries. I saw a meme that said, stop naming your children after biblical names if you're not practicing it. They said, earlier today I got robbed by Abraham, so. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Any other questions? Right over there. How in the city with only two gates did the army communicate across the long distances? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think if I understand your question, it also is relating to, you know, there were no cell phones back then. How did they communicate with Jerusalem? How did they communicate? Well, these sites are actually, Jerusalem is on 2,700 feet above sea level. And then you have the, the hill country. And these sites are kind of in the foothills leading from the coastal plain, from the Mediterranean coastal plain, in the foothills leading up to Jerusalem. And we know today, based again on some of these um, inscriptions that had been found on pottery. There was a whole cache of them that were found um, by uh, James Leslie Starkey at Lachish, another site that I excavated recently. And in the 1930s, he found a whole grouping of these in the gate of the city um, that had been placed there just before the Babylonians destroyed the city on their way up to destroy the temple in Jerusalem. And in that particular case, um, one of those, we call it um, the Ost Ostraca number four in this group of inscriptions, it said, beware, we are searching for the signal fires of Lachish because we no longer can see the signal fires of Azekah. So these are two cities. And in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, who was a prophet at that time and predicting that these things would take place in the future, he actually writes and says, of all the cities of Judah, only two cities still remained outside of Jerusalem, Azekah and Lachish. Wow. So here we have a, 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 a text in the gate of Lachish, probably sent there as a last minute warning message, we're looking, they're like smoke signals, you know, like the, uh, the natives of this country used to do. And, and we're, we're communicating, we no longer see the signal fires of Azeka, which means it was already captured and destroyed by the Babylonians. Watch out, you're next. And we know the next step. We know Jeremiah, what Jeremiah says. Now we have the text at Lachish, and we know Lachish was destroyed next on the way up to Jerusalem. So yes, from that, from that little bit of evidence, we know that they, that's one way they could have communicated. Any other questions? Right over there. In order for the average person to find these historic and scientific facts, they have to be very curious. So my question is for Christians that are living today, how can we combat the suppression of these historic facts by the science world? Where can you find more information about this material actually probably, right? And, and how, how, how's that disseminated? Yeah, you know, this is a big frustration that I have in my field because we all are kind of in our ivory towers and our silos and we're writing to a very small group of people that are listening to each other and, and we need to popularize this material. That's a very huge thing right now that we need to do. And we, I just came from a conference in Houston two weeks ago where a group of, an international group of archeologists got together um, to honor my, my, my former professor at the uh, Arizona where I studied. He's 90 years old now and he's the leading archeologist in our field in the world. And he was reflecting on 60 years of, of scholarship in this world. And one of the big issues that came up is how do we, how do we keep this going? 
How do we keep biblical archaeology going? Because the humanities are shrinking, STEM is, is growing. How do we keep this field particularly growing? And it was kind of depressing because a lot of the, I mean, we had, we had professors from UCLA, from University of California, San Diego, from Dartmouth, uh, you know, uh, Ivy League institution, um, University of Chicago, and, and other institutions as well, discussing this issue. And, um, and I, I think popularization is one of the things that we talked about. We have to get the message out of, of the valuable things that we do for the community. And we had a number of young doctoral students in this group as well. It was a small kind of think tank of about 25 professors and, and uh, you know, experts. And then, and then we had doctoral students as well. And, and they all said, what are you guys doing? Have you not heard of social media before? You know, why aren't you, why aren't you doing this? So this is something we really have to do. I would say there's a couple of resources. There's Biblical Archaeology Review, which is a magazine I mentioned. They come out twice a year, and it's a popular magazine, and you can find them at the Barnes & Noble Bookstore or online. I've, everything is, is online right now. So Biblical Archaeology Society, um, online. You can also look at um, another organization called the Associates for Biblical Research, um, which is a more... Um, evangelical, I would say, a group of Christians and, and, and trained archaeologists that are putting stuff out. They have a website and they also publish an, a, a magazine called Bible and Spade. Those are the two kind of popularization mediums that we have right now, but we definitely do have to make more. Thank right. you. And I think especially with this episode, all that we've learned, I think it would be great to share this with somebody else who may have some questions about the Bible. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. That's Wonderful. right. Any other questions? Right over there. You said earlier that uh, it was only in the Bible that you would find prophecy and facts, but couldn't we find that also in the Quran and the Torah since they were also made by God? Even in ancient uh, societies, there, there, there were elements of prophecy. They didn't quite operate the same way that prophecy operates in the Bible, in the sense that, um, you know, even, even in even in spiritualistic forms, you know, you, you can go to a, um, you know, a soothsayer or you can go to someone to try to see what the future holds. We know that Saul did that, King Saul did that in the Bible as well. Um, this is not something that is accepted in the Bible, but I'm just saying you don't have long-range prophecy in the same way in many of these sources. Now, the, you mentioned the Torah. The Torah is part of the Bible. It's the first five books of the Bible, so you definitely have it there. There's no question about it. The first prophecy in Scripture is Genesis 3.15, which is a prediction about the Messiah crushing the serpent's head. So that certainly is, is there, and, and so you'll find that, and you'll find prophecies relating to Abraham um, and his, his descendants, uh, which is found in uh, Genesis uh, 12 and 15. And, and, and there's, there's, that's, that's the foundation. Genesis is the foundation for the rest of Scripture. But the Quran doesn't really have prophecy in the same way. Um, when you read the Quran, it's, it's, it's more of um, the revelation that, you know, Muhammad received from Allah, and it's, it's, it's much more esoteric. It's, it's, just to give you an example, if you were to take the Bible and add up all the place names, cities, rivers, countries, places where, where these stories took place, and you do the same with the entire Quran, okay, you do the same thing there. By the time you get to Genesis 10, you will you have used up all the number of place names that the entire Quran has. You just, it, you know, so there, there, there's definitely a difference in terms of history because they weren't concerned about the God who interacts in history in the same way in the Quran as we have in the Bible. Um, and, and for that reason, because the Bible teaches a linear view of history and a forward-looking view of history, you also have a God that can predict the future as well as relate to us what happened in the past. And so he's the God of uh, the past, he's the God of the present, and he's the God of the future. And that's a huge element that we find in Scripture. That's right. And it sounds like, you know, when you read the Bible too, like you see plenty of examples where God is predicting something that, that took place, and we can see from history it took place, and it gives us confidence, wait a minute. That's right. What he said in the past took place, we can trust him for what he says for us in the future. Exactly, exactly. Wonderful. Any other questions? Right over there. If the Jews have direct access to history and these findings, and they've been authenticated, then what makes it so hard for them to accept the existence of Jesus Christ? 
Oh, that's a, that's a loaded question and one that's very difficult to answer because every person that is part of, of that group of people would have to give different answers maybe for that. I think if we go back historically and look at the New Testament, we already see um, some evidence of, of that there. Um, we, we see the wise men coming from the east and asking, where, where is this king to be born? They were following the star, you know, and they come to King Herod. And who does King Herod do? He calls, he calls the, the priests, he calls the, the scholars, the, the Jewish rabbinical scholars, and he, the, the Jewish scholars, and he says, you know, what do the prophecies say? And what did they answer? Bethlehem of, of, of Ephrata. They pointed back to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And, uh, and, and so that's where they went. Um, so yes, they knew, but they were expecting something very, very different. And, um, and there's just so much history that has gone on over the centuries between Christians and between Jews. It makes it very difficult in many, in many ways. We, we think of the Holocaust. We'll talk about that maybe in another program. We will, you know, we, we think about some of these difficult things they experience. There's, there's really a divide between Christianity and Judaism just from that cultural uh, kind of thing. We share so much, and yet there's a divide there. Um, and, and yet, we have a growing number, a huge growing number of Messianic Jews who have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, who have accepted the New Testament, and still identify with their Jewish roots. And I, I see them when I, when I travel to Israel. I, I, um, I meet with them. Some of them are actually scholars as well. And they, they are openly professing their belief in, in Jesus Christ. So I think when you really carefully study the evidence and study the evidence for yourself, people are coming to that realization, even in their Jewish tradition. And of course, we have to understand the first apostles, the first disciples of Jesus, they initially saw themselves as true Jews who had accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And the concept of Christianity was something that came a little bit later in time as that movement continued to grow. Thank you so much, Dr. Hossel. This has been an exciting journey into biblical archaeology. It's fascinating, and uh, I'm excited for what the future holds in regards to the things you're going to share with us. 